Hello everyone and welcome to video 16 in the OCR A-Level PE Anatomy and Physiology series. In today's video we're going to be looking at aerobic training. So basically in this video we need to understand the factors affecting your cardiovascular cardiorespiratory function, we need to understand methods of measuring your cardiorespiratory effectiveness and we need to look at the short and long term adaptations to aerobic training. So moving into the video, pause it here and get down these two definitions and that is it for the definitions of this video. So now we are into the video, this, we need to understand these four factors which affect your VO2 max. So the first one is your uh, individual physiological makeup. So as we know, individual to individual varies massively. So basically, some people have more efficient cardiovascular systems, so they have a higher VO2 max. It, the reason for this is some individuals have larger lung volumes, strong ventricular muscles, and more slow oxidative muscle fibres, which means that they can inspire, transport, and utilise more oxygen. The second factor is training. So the effect is, is aerobic training can lead to a VO2 max increase of around 10 to 20 percent. This is because you can obtain cardiac hypertrophy, increase your red blood cell counts and mitochondria counts, and you can have more efficient lungs, which allows you to inspire, transport and utilize more oxygen. The third of four is age. So basically, VO2 max peaks at 20 and then decreases by about 1 percent every year. That doesn't mean to say that you can't have a higher VO2 max at 25 and you did at 20. Basically, if you train aerobically for a year when you're 25, you will have, and you, but you didn't train at all aerobically when you were 20, you will have a bigger, well, larger VO2 max. It just means that your potential for your greatest VO2 max was when you were 20 and your potential will decrease by 1% each year. Now, the reason for this is you lose elasticity of lung, heart and blood vessel tissue, which means you can inhale, transport and utilise less oxygen. The final one is gender. So males tend to have a 15 to 30% higher VO2 max than females. And the reason for this is males have larger lung and blood volumes. They have larger hearts and greater muscle mass, allowing them to inspire, transport and utilise more oxygen per minute. So moving forward, we need to understand four methods of measuring your aerobic efficiencies. The first one is direct gas analysis. What this is, this is a continuous progressive intensity test to exhaustion, measuring your VO2 max by analysing percentage of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your expired air. The benefits of this test is it's accurate, valid and gives reliable measurements. And also, you can use various equipment if it suits a variety of athletes. You see at the bottom here, we got a rower. You can also do this on a bike, and you can do this running. So there's the variety. The drawbacks, however, is the expensive is expensive, and therefore exclusive to extreme what well, elite athletes. It's also an exhaustive test, so it's unsuitable for the elderly or those with underlying health conditions such as tuberculosis. Second one is the NCF multi-stage fitness test. So this is a progressive intensity 20 meter shuttle run test which compares results with a standardised results table. The benefits is it is suitable for large groups. If you've got a group of year 10 PE students and you're, you know, you're testing them, kind of ask a fitness if they want to do a PEP on that, you can do that. Uh, also minimal equipment is needed so it's cheap and there are standardised tables readily available online. The drawbacks, however, is because it's an exhaustive test, once again, it's unsuitable for the elderly and those with health issues. It is only a prediction, not a measurement, and it's less suitable for those non-runners. The third one is the Cooper 12 minute run. You can also do this in the pool as well, but apparently not on the specification anymore. This is a continuous maximal intensity test, which measures the distance covered in 12 minutes and results are compared to standardized results tables. The benefit of this is it is suitable for large groups, once again. Minimal equipment needed, as you see, you just need a track with a known distance and standardized results tables are available. The drawbacks, however, is once again, it's exhaustive, so unsuitable for elderly or those with health issues. Only a prediction, once again, not a measurement, and it's less suitable for those non-runners, once again. The final one is the Queen's College Step Test. So this is a continuous three-minute step test which uses heart rate recovery to predict an injured VO2 max. So basically, after you finish for the three minutes, you'll test your pulse. Next minute, test your pulse. Next minute, and as soon as it gets down to your resting pulse, that's the time that you look at on the table and get your predicted VO2 max. The benefits of this is it is some maximum intensity, so it is good for the elderly and those with health issues. Standardised tables, which are you know available for analysis, and minimal equipment is required. So you just need a box in all the dumbbells. It's the only diagram I could get. The drawbacks, however, is once again, it is only a prediction, not a measurement. And unfortunately, this step may be too high for some people. And you may think that's weird, but some people are rehabilitating from injury. Some people are very old. Some people have really bad like muscle atrophy conditions. So that's what I mean by that. Now we need to understand the about different types of aerobic training methods. So the first one is continuous training, which is long periods of sub-maximal intensity exercise without periods of rest. 
you perform at 60 to 80 percent of your maximum heart rate is the intensity, and the duration is usually between 20 and 80 minutes. Uh, high intensity interval training, or HIT, on the other hand, is repeated periods of anaerobic short duration exercise followed by periods of active rest to recovery. The work intensity to rest intensity ratio is about 90% of maximum heart rate and rest as 40 to 50% of maximum heart rate. The work to rest ratio is 1 to 1 or 2 to 1, and the duration is 5 to 10 minutes. Now you may be thinking, 5 to 10 minutes, that is no time at all. Well, you perform flat out everything you've got for 30 seconds, for example. Your, your muscles are depleted, your PC stores are depleted, everything's depleted. So you really can't go longer than 5 to 10 minutes with those breaks in between. So now we need to look at the long-term adaptations to aerobic training. So the first ones are cardiovascular adaptations, which include cardiac hypertrophy, increased elasticity of atrial walls, um, artery walls, sorry, capillarization, increased red blood cell count, increased blood plasma. With these guys, quickly, um, just on these slides, remember to pause it, because I will be talking very fast, so pause it and get the notes down when and if you acquire. So the next bit is the respiratory adaptation. So there is increased strength of respiratory muscles, and you also have increased surface area alveoli. What does that mean? You can get more air in. You can go to fusion gradient, basically. Uh, the next thing we need to understand is muscular adaptation. So your fast oxidative glycolytic muscle fibres improve their aerobic capacity or capability. You've got hypertrophy of your slow oxidative and fast oxidative glycolytic muscle fibres. It increases your glycogen and triglyceride stores, which are aerobic energy fuel stores, and increase size and number of, of mitochondria, which can help produce ATP aerobically more frequently, as that is the place or the site of aerobic respiration. And the, finally, the metabolic adaptation. So there's an increase in aerobic enzyme action, increased resting metabolic rate, and reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, why that last one is, is because if you're exercising aerobically, you are moving the glucose into the muscle cells and, gly and liver cells, and you can store them in there and use them. So, you know, your body basically is more able to regulate your blood uh, glucose concentration. So what have we learned in today's video? We can now explain the factors affecting your cardiorespiratory function, the methods of measuring cardiorespiratory effectiveness, and both the short and long-term adaptations to aerobic training. Moving into the next video, we're going to look at strength training. So we need to understand the factors affecting strength, methods of evaluating a performance strength, different types of strength, and training to develop different kinds of strength. So thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please share with your friends who are also studying AWPE, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.